Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Recipes and Helpful Hacks for Healthy Eating, presented by the American Student Dental Association. We'll get started momentarily after some instructions and introductions. My name is Kasha Halko, and I'm the facilitator of tonight's program. I'm ASDA's marketing manager and one of 13 full-time staff that work here at ASDA. Tonight's presenter is Sue Haas. This webinar is a presentation of ASDA's wellness initiative, which began in 2014 following the tragic death of ASDA past president, Juan Lee. The goal of the initiative is to equip ASDA members with a variety of resources related to overall wellness, including five dimensions in particular, emotional, physical, environmental, occupational, and intellectual. You'll find resources for each of these, as well as links to the wellness centers at all dental schools on ASDA's website. This September, ASDA is also celebrating Wellness Month, where members and chapters put a special focus on dental student wellness. After tonight's program, ASDA will offer two more Wellness Month webinars, and I encourage you to find information about those on ASDA's website. At this time, we'd like to recognize the exclusive sponsor of ASDA's Wellness Initiative. Great West Financial, on behalf of the ADA Student Members Insurance Plans, is committed to helping you stay healthy so you can achieve your career and life goals. At the same time, they want to give you the peace of mind of knowing that if anything ever did happen, injury, illness, or worse, you and your family can have some financial protection. That's why they offer ADA-sponsored disability and life insurance at no cost to ADA student members while you're in dental school. You can request the insurance at bringhealthyon.com. At this site, you'll also find lots of healthy tips and a sign-up page to receive health-related emails. Tonight, we're going to focus on eating well at school with suggestions for three healthy meals. Our presenter, Sue Haas, is the co-owner of Main Dish Media, a food media company in Des Moines, Iowa, and also the co-creator of Look, Cook, and Eat, a digital magazine and website that teaches people with disabilities how to cook and to become more independent. She's a proficient recipe developer and writer who dabbles in food styling and loves teaching cooking classes, especially to high school students and adults with special needs. Right now, Sue is going to demonstrate healthy recipes for breakfast, lunch, and a snack. These are just three of the recipes that you can find on bringhealthyon.com. After the demonstrations, Sue will join us live to take your questions about food, nutrition, and cooking. So let's begin. Hey, everybody. Welcome to this webinar. My name is Sue and I am a food editor and we'll be uh, talking you through a few recipes with some tips and techniques um, on how to eat healthy simply um, because you're busy people uh, with dental school and sometimes it's hard to get good meals in. So without further ado, it's, we're going to talk breakfast. Uh, it is the most important meal of the day. Mom was right. Um, and it's important after eight hours of sleep or studying that you got that you refuel yourself with a great blend of complex carbohydrates, some fat to fill you up and satisfy, and some protein to also fill you up. And I have just the thing. It's avocado toast. Of course, this is a thing right now. Avocado toast is big. Um, but this one is embellished with some spinach and a uh, fried egg. So um, without further ado, let's get into it right now. The hardest part of this recipe is probably choosing a ripe avocado. So I have a few here to look at. Um, this is an unripe avocado. This is a Haas avocado. It's um, probably the most common variety you're going to find at the grocery store. This one is green. You'll notice that it's quite green and um, rather smooth. There's some bumps on it, but this it's a little bit smoother than normal. But what really gives it away is it being unripe or underripe anyway, is that it's hard, um, really, really hard. This, you could not get a knife through very easily and it would really not taste good. So avocados are one of the few fruits, it is a fruit, that ripen on, um, not on the tree, but off the tree. So they're picked uh, just like this, hard, and then they will develop and, uh, and ripen 
as they sit. You can keep an unripe avocado on your countertop for a couple of days and it will ripen just fine. You can also put it in a paper bag with an apple or a banana. The ethylene gas that those fruits give off will help hasten the ripening process and get your avocado to this, this point, which is much softer, but yet still firm, okay? I wish you could feel this, because it's really the only way to tell, but um, no, actually it's not. Uh, this is another way to tell. You see that stem, that little knob? If that comes off easily, which this one does, and you can kind of see the green inside, um, that tells you that the avocado is good to go. This one, if you notice and you go back to that knob, it does not come off. So that's a good indication that the avocado isn't ready. An overripe avocado looks a little bit like this. It's really dark, almost purple black. Um, this knob will come off very easily and the skin feels a little baggy or, or um, loose around the fruit. Inside, it's probably going to be a little bit dark, um, not have that really pretty green color. We'll probably have a little bit of a flavor difference. It'll just taste a little riper than normal, but you can use it in, um, on the avocado toast since we're going to be mashing it up, or guacamole, or throw it in a smoothie. It'll be, it'll be great. So now that you have a perfect avocado, how do you cut it? This is what I do. Um, I put the avocado in a small towel in my hand. This is just to protect my hand. And now I'm going to take my chef's knife and penetrate that avocado skin with the blade and holding the avocado, moving the avocado around the chef's knife. The knife really doesn't move. It stays pretty stationary. And then you end up back where you started. Okay, knife comes out and you're going to twist it to separate the halves. Nice. Okay, now we're only going to use half of the avocado for our toast. So this half we're going to use for the toast, but um, this half I'm going to store. The avocado flesh will turn brown as it sits in the air. So you want to put a little lemon juice, lime juice, uh, vinegar on the flesh to help keep that browning to a minimum. It's still going to happen. Um, it doesn't change the flavor. It's just more of a visual thing. Uh, but if you wanted to use this half instead of this half or both for remaking two, whatever, you need to get rid of that pit. Now, this is how I like to do it. It's going to go back into the towel so I protect my hand. I'm going to take my blade and just give that pit a good tap. So I've, I've got the blade um, in the pit and then I'm going to twist that so it comes out just like that. To get it off the blade, I'm not going to grab it like this, but instead I'm going to come down to the cutting board and just press the blade down to release it from the knife, from the pit. Whoops. Okay. Now I need to mash some avocado. So I'm going to take a small bowl and a spoon. And I really don't need this towel anymore and scoop the flesh out into the bowl, just like that. Great. And then I'm going to take a fork and mash the avocado coarsely. You don't want it to be super smooth. I mean, you could, but there's no need for it to be super smooth. You just sort of want it spreadable on your whole grain toast, which we'll get to in a second. You could also, if you really didn't have time for this or just wanted to uh, make this even simpler, use guacamole, purchase guacamole from the store. Okay, here's my toasted whole grain bread. You can use any kind you like, um, up to you, but whole grain is complex carbohydrate. That's gonna really help keep you full. It's also delicious, so um, there's that. Um, if you wanted to make this a portable sandwich, you could use a whole wheat tortilla that you've warmed in the microwave slightly so it's pliable. You could also use a whole wheat English muffin and sandwich everything together and take it with you that way. Um, lots of options. So you're just going to spread the avocado onto your toast like that. Season with just a little pepper if you so desire. And now we're going to set this aside and 
come back to it in just a second. Let me clear off some of this table. Now we are going to saute some spinach. Clean this up. But first, I've got a pan, a, a non-stick skillet heating up. It's pretty warm, so I'm going to turn it down for just a second. You can kind of see smoke rising off of it. That's not what you want, but you do want a non-stick skillet. You're going to be sautéing some spinach and then cooking an egg in the same pan. And eggs are really, really easier to deal with if they're in a non-stick skillet. So to this, you're going to add a little bit of oil, half teaspoon or so. This is olive oil, healthy, healthy oil. You can use vegetable oil if you don't have olive oil, but I suggest you get some olive oil. It's really good, healthy fat for you. I'm going to leave this pan off to the side for just a second while, to let it cool down while I mince some garlic. So here's a clove of garlic. And to get that paper off, you're just going to take your chef's knife and press on that clove to smash it a little bit and loosen that paper. The paper can really stick and it's kind of annoying. Now, Simply mince that up and this will add great flavor to the spinach. You might need to clean the blade off every once in a while. Perfect. All right. So now we're going to scoop that up on our, the knife blade and move back to our pan, which has cooled down nicely now, and add the garlic to the pan. You don't want that oil too hot or the garlic could burn and get bitter and that's no no good. Here I have two cups of baby spinach. Now the spinach has been washed three times they say on the package. I like to give it a little extra rinse just for uh, good measure but that um, the water that's left on the leaves will help steam the spinach and cook it quickly. So don't panic this this pan looks really small but that spinach is going to shrink down a lot. And I'm just going to take tongs, stir it around. Tongs are a fantastic tool. And if you, if you don't have any in your kitchen, make that something you do this week. Is buy a set of tongs because they are like an extension of your hand and you will find a million different things to use them for. All right, you can also use, if you don't have any spinach or you prefer baby kale, that's another terrific option for the spinach. Um, but leafy greens are gonna add a lot of iron, lots of vitamins and minerals, um, calcium, I mean, tons of stuff. You want, to, you want spinach or kale in your, in your sandwich. All right, we're gonna move back to the toast. and just arrange the spinach on top of your avocado. Delicious. All right, now we're gonna move back to the stove and cook our egg. Okay, I'm gonna add another half teaspoon of oil to the pan. And then I'm gonna crack the egg into the skillet. Now, I'm not gonna use the edge of the skillet. That shatters the shell into tiny, tiny pieces which can um, end up in your egg that uh, isn't awesome to eat, obviously. If you crack the egg on the countertop, you get a larger break and you don't have as much, uh, you don't run the risk of getting shell in your egg quite as much, okay. All right, so we're gonna let that cook for about five to seven minutes. Uh, you want that, the whites to be set and the yolk to be uh, heated through. If you're not crazy about runny yolk, that's totally fine. You can cook it longer. You can scramble the egg as well. That, that is perfectly fine. But through the magic of television, I have here an egg that I've already cooked. So we're gonna pretend, fast forward to cooked egg. We're gonna come back to our toast and scoop the egg out. This is why nonstick is so important. 
because your eggs come out really easily. Uh, now I'm going to put a little salsa on top. This is just a plain old regular salsa from the grocery store. Use whatever you have. Salsa verde is excellent too. Salsa verde is green salsa if you like that. A little bit on top. If you are still like a little bit of heat, um, hot sauce is not out of the question. I like a little more pepper myself. And that is a terrific breakfast that really doesn't take very long to make at all. You can get a few things prepped up ahead of time in the evening, uh, the day prior if you so desire. Um, but this is an awesome way to start your day and I guarantee that you will be full well through lunch, um, but don't get too full because I've got a really terrific chicken salad that uh, I want to teach you about in just a few minutes. So stay right there and we'll be right back. Hey everybody, it's lunchtime now. I'm sure you're starting to feel a little hungry after your hard day at class. Uh, so I'm here to show you a really terrific chicken salad. Now, but first, before we get into this, I need to tell you a little bit about some culinary history. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, but it's a really famous hotel in New York City. And back in the 1800s, um, a Russian immigrant who was the dining room manager invented a Waldorf salad, which consisted of apple and celery and mayonnaise. It was a hit. But we are, and we're taking that theme and kind of working it a little bit and bulking it up to create a chicken salad using those Waldorf ingredients plus some. So this is Waldorf chicken salad, and it starts with dressing. So we're going to make a dressing in, the, in a big bowl. This bowl needs to be large enough to mix everything in. We're just going to mix the dressing right in the bowl, save you some dishes. We're going to start with a third a cup of low-fat mayonnaise, one-third of a cup of plain yogurt. You can use Greek yogurt if you'd like. Uh, you'll get a little bit of extra protein push from the Greek yogurt. We're going to use two teaspoons of lemon juice. Now you can use uh, bottled lemon juice, that's just fine. I like fresh, I prefer the flavor of fresh, so I'm just going to have this lemon and then to squeeze the juice in, I'm going to put the lemon half in my hand, palm face down in my palm, and squeeze, and this will hopefully prevent the seeds from getting into my dressing. If they do get into the dressing, you can just fish them out with a spoon. A lemon half will give you probably close to a table, there are the seeds, see that? A lemon half will give you close to a tablespoon of juice. So we only needed two teaspoons for that dressing. Uh, maybe a little bit extra got in there, but we're not going to worry about that. And then we're going to season with about a quarter teaspoon of salt. Just a couple pinches. And mix that all together. You can use a whisk, and actually I think I will. A whisk will incorporate things a little bit better more quickly, I should say. The spatula works fine. All right, and that is all it takes for the dressing. So we're gonna set this aside and talk for a little bit about chicken. Chicken is your primary protein in this salad and it can come from any number of sources, if you will. Um, you can use a rotisserie chicken, which uh, is super convenient and just pull the meat off the bones and chop that up. You get a little mixture of white and dark meat that way. You can use leftover chicken if you've grilled or um, roasted a chicken for dinner and have some leftovers, you can certainly use that. You can use canned chicken or you can even use cooked chicken strips from the deli section of the grocery store. You might need to chop those up a little bit just to get them into smaller bite-sized pieces. But what I like to do is actually poach chicken breasts uh, myself. It's super easy and fast. You can do it while you're putting the rest of your um, salad together. All you do is you take a saucepan and add chicken breasts, maybe three or four, depending on their size. Um, it really varies depending on how big those chicken breasts might be to get three cups of uh, 
chicken for the salad, but add water to cover and then a good amount of salt. You're gonna want about two or three tablespoons of salt in that water um, to, to really add flavor to the chicken. Bring that to a boil on the stove and let, that, uh, let the chicken cook for two to three minutes. Um, and then off heat, cover and let sit until they're cool enough to handle. Um, by the time the chicken might not be done um, in the two to three minutes that it boils, but it will continue to cook in that hot water and it won't dry out and get, um, and get dry. So this is a cooked poached chicken breast and you're just simply going to cut it into pieces, into strips first, I guess I should say, and then into, oh, you know, half to three quarter inch pieces for this salad. You want a good, pretty big piece. And that is just gonna go right into your dressing along with the rest of the chicken here. Okay. Now, we're gonna add an apple. I'm gonna cut this apple up. This is a pink lady apple. This is fall, which means apples are everywhere. And you have a variety of apples to choose from at the grocery store. I've got pink lady here. You can use really any variety that you'd like. Um, doesn't matter if it's red, that just adds some pretty color. Uh, green is fine. Um, I am not a crazy fan of red delicious apples. They don't have very much flavor to me. So I would not use them here, but um, Fuji, Gala, Braeburn, there are tons of apples on the market. Feel free to get whatever you'd like. Now this is a cool way to, to cut your apple. Um, you set it on its base, just like this, and then cut it just to the right of the core, just to the right of the stem. And you're gonna just let that lobe fall, okay? Now, turn that apple on a flat side. Now it won't roll around on you. That is super safe and cut down again just to the right of the stem or the core. Cool. Flat side again and cut down to the right. So you're basically isolating the core like this. Okay, there's your core. It goes into the trash. And now you can cut the apple into pieces. Just like that. Just keep it always on the flat side. You know, even if you are cutting slices like that, you want to always make sure that that apple does not roll around on you. That is when injuries happen. And you want pieces that are probably at no bigger than the chicken. You want to be able to eat this with a fork or with in a, in a wrap, which I'll show you. And there we go. Awesome. All of these, the whole apple goes into the salad. Perfect. Now, we are going to add some grapes. This is a combo of red and green grapes that I've cut in half. Um, halved grapes might be a little fussy, but they're easier to eat. So. You can use all green or all red, it doesn't matter. Whatever you have around works for me. You can even use raisins instead if you don't have any uh, fresh grapes around. And celery, got a little bit of celery here, but I'm gonna finish cutting the celery. What I do for that is trim off the top and the bottom, cut the stalk in half, and then cut the stalk in half again lengthwise and then cut down across the sticks. Now celery is one of those vegetables that adds a ton of flavor, but no one really, who likes to eat celery on its own? I know I don't, but it, I really miss it if uh, the flavor and crunch aren't there. If you don't have any celery, you don't like celery, I still um, would be missing the crunchiness, so I think you could use uh, water chestnuts that would make a great substitute for celery. It doesn't have quite the same flavor, but they're gonna add that crunch that really makes the salad great. All right, so we have our celery, and now finally, our walnuts. 
I've been uh, toasting some walnuts over here on the stove. Um, I, toasting walnuts adds a ton of flavor. It takes away some of the bitterness that's inherent to a walnut. All you do is you put the walnuts in a dry skillet. You don't need any oil or butter. And you toast them over medium heat, uh, tossing often or stirring until you get a really nice smell, aroma of toasted nuts. Um, you want to toss them often because they'll scorch really quickly. You can also toast them in the oven, which is a little bit more evenly, uh, an even way to toast them. But either way, very fast on the stove, five to seven minutes, to tossing, tossing. And then we're going to chop these up into pretty small pieces. We don't want them super fine. But um, I don't think a big chunk of walnut is what we're after either. And we're going to use about half a cup. We're going to put a fourth of a cup in the salad directly and then use the rest of the, rest of the nuts to garnish the salad toward the end. If you don't like walnuts, uh, by all means, you can use almonds. You can use pecans. The, that would be delicious as well. Um, pine nuts would also be quite good. I do recommend toasting all of those nuts though, just so you can, it adds just a great layer of flavor and um, is really easy to do on the stove. So I'm going to take about half of these nuts and put them in the salad and save the rest. We'll just put those right there for garnishing. And now we are going to stir everything together. You could, if you want to, if you have some fresh herbs on hand, uh, would not hurt at all to put them in this salad. I love tarragon. It's one of my favorite herbs. Um, but I also know that not many people have tarragon just hanging out in their refrigerator. Uh, but parsley is good. Cilantro is fine. Um, really, any, any fresh herb, dill would be great. Uh, is is wonderful. I recommend though not using dry herbs uh, because dry herbs are really best if they have a chance to be cooked and obviously we're not cooking the salad in any way. There you go. See it makes a lot so you can have this on hand to just sit in the fridge if you want if you want to take it with you or or just eat some on a cracker if you need a snack. Um, lovely. What I like to do to serve it though is to serve it with some butter lettuce. This is a really tender, fresh lettuce, and uh, it's delicious. You can also use romaine. Um, if you're not eating gluten, this is a terrific way to make kind of a wrap with it, if you'd like. Um, a great way also to get a little more vegetable into your diet. Um, you can also serve it with crackers, uh, a whole grain baguette on the side, lovely as well. So we're going to just spoon some of that onto the plate. And I'm using a spatula because I forgot a spoon. But that's OK. It's, it's working. Delicious. All right. Now you have lunch, but don't fill up because I've got a terrific snack for you. And we all know that snacks are our favorite part of the day. So stick around. We'll be right back in just a second. Okay, so we've had breakfast, we've had lunch, and now we have snacks, my favorite meal of the day, if you must know. Um, but a healthy eating plan can get derailed in a hurry if all you're left with is chips and packets of cookies. Um, in my opinion, a healthy eating snack, a healthy snack, um, needs to have some things uh, like flavor and texture and a lot of different things coming at you at once in order to get you satisfied and fill up. Protein is another important aspect of a good snack. So today we have uh, stuffed mini bell peppers that um, will totally fit the bill for all of those things. Um, let's start off with the mini bell peppers. These are found in bags in the produce aisle at the grocery store. Um, totally convenient and great to have on hand for snacking. You can also use them in dishes for bell peppers. 
uh, salads or stir fries or whatever, um, these are gonna be stuffed with hummus and olives. And so um, we need six of mini bell peppers for this dish, but what we're gonna do is simply take a paring knife, a small knife, and cut the top off. This is where you really want a good knife. You always want a good knife. And then we're gonna just pull the seeds out with our fingers, the seeds and the ribs. You want a good knife because um, sometimes the skin of bell peppers can be kind of tough. And if your knife is dull, if it's not great quality, it's gonna give you a hard time. So I highly recommend investing in good knives. And if you don't have good knives, by all means, put them on your Christmas list this year because you will be happy about it. One thing um, I highly recommend that you don't do with your knives, your new, new knives from Christmas, is put them in the dishwasher. That is probably the worst thing you could do. This is a really skinny pepper. Worst thing you could do for your knives. That's gonna dull the blade faster than anything. Okay. These little mini bell peppers are awesome to put on um, veggie, veggie trays. Uh, the holidays are coming up. You're gonna do some entertaining probably and they're just really cute and fun to eat um, as opposed to bell pepper strips that you cut from a regular bell pepper. They last for a long time in the fridge too. So um, good, good thing to have around. All right, this is our last pepper. These are, uh, even though they're small, they're not hot. So don't, um, don't get worried about their heat level. However, I should like, uh, mention that you probably should check the bag just to make sure they say sweet on them somewhere or they don't say hot on them because um, you might get a little bit of a surprise if you're not careful. But by and large, these are all sweet peppers. Okay, we've got those prepped. Now we're gonna move on to our hummus. We are using prepared hummus here, which is everywhere these days. Um, comes in lots of different flavors. We're using plain, but you can use roasted red pepper, roasted garlic. They even have an olive tapenade, which is tapenade is like a, an olive spread, um, which would totally negate the need for any olives in this dish. We're gonna use half a cup of hummus, whether it's plain or flavored. And we're gonna measure it into a quart size plastic bag. And I love hummus uh, on crackers. Uh, it's terrific. I will slice up some cucumbers and dip them into hummus, delicious. Okay, this looks like about a half a cup of hummus. Anyway, it's, it's a terrific thing to have on hand. You can spread it on sandwiches too, um, but Hummus is awesome for healthy eating and full of protein. A two tablespoon serving is about 10 grams of protein, so that's really great, and plenty of fiber as well. All right, so we're gonna keep this in the bag over to the side. Now we're gonna talk about olives. We're gonna use Kalamata olives for this. This is sort of like the big Greek olive, and it's a delicious olive. It's got a lot of bite and brine and um, great flavor. Also really good texture. It's meaty um, and it, it tastes, feels good in your mouth uh, when you chew it. You can use other kinds of olives if, if this is not your favorite or you don't have another kind. Green olives with the little pimentos inside, perfectly fine. Even black, black olives from a can, also fine. Um, they're not my particular favorite, but uh, they, will, they will do the trick if, you, if that's what you like. So feel free to change up the olives. Now, if you don't want to buy a whole jar of olives or a can or whatever, um, check out if your store has a, uh, an olive bar or an antipasto bar. It's a great place to find olives that you can just mix and match different types um, for a, not a lot of money. So um, just a, a thought for you if you don't wanna fill your fridge with jars. Um, these olives, and incidentally, olives are one of the most cult or oldest cultivated foods in the world and olives go from green to black on the tree. So a green olive 
um, ripens into a black olive. You don't have green olive trees and black olive trees. So uh, they, they are completely inedible if you try to eat one off the tree. Don't do it. It's really unpleasant. Uh, but they must be cured or brined before they can be eaten. So what we need for this are about a tablespoon of finely chopped Kalamata olives or whatever olive you're using, uh, which is going to be about four or five olives probably total. So I'm just going to grab these out of my jar or my bowl. Um, pitted, I always get pitted olives because they're obviously a lot easier to work with. If by mistake you buy a jar of olives with pits, you will just have to remove the pit, um, which is a simple procedure, but try, try to get olives with no pits. It'll just save you some time. So all you do is you just rock your knife, and this is a chef's knife, and the chef's knife is great because it has a slightly curved blade that allows you to rock through things easily. Some Knives have flat blades, which aren't as easy to um, use in this manner, but they're still totally usable. Again, a sharp knife is good. Now these are, olives are pretty soft, so um, you won't have too much trouble if you have not, if your knife isn't super sharp. And you might have to clean the blade off a little bit too. All right, that looks fantastic. We want small bits because we're gonna be squeezing our bag of hummus and olives to squeezing it into the peppers. So I'll show you how that works in just a second. So you're going to add the chopped olives to the bag and seal the bag. And you want to get as much air out of the bag as you can so it's easy to squeeze the hummus. All right, to mix the hummus and olives together, you just want to squish the bag. Get that all mixed in there. Great, that looks perfect. All right, now you're gonna try to push as much of the hummus mixture to a corner of the bag as you can. Just concentrate it in any corner, it doesn't matter. All right, yeah, this is sort of a makeshift piping bag. Now, you're gonna cut a little corner off, and you don't want it too small, but you also don't want it too big, so Probably about half an inch is perfect. It needs to be big enough for the olives to, whoops, olives to come out. Okay, so hold it upright so it doesn't come out the hole. And then you're just going to take, oh wait, I forgot. Plastic container for storage. All right, so you're gonna just gently squeeze. This is a pretty small pepper, so that didn't have doesn't have too much stuff in it. And then, oops, tippy, there you go. All right, and this one's a little bit bigger, but you're just gonna squeeze that in. It's so much neater than trying to spoon it in. There you go. Fill those peppers up, and then you just pop them in a plastic container, and hopefully they don't fall down the sides like that. And you can store the container in your fridge and just grab these as you need them during study breaks or whatever. Or, oh, here's our really skinny one. Or carry it with you in an insulated tote bag, lunch bag or whatever to classes or the gym. All right, there we go. And that is a terrific snack. Protein packed and really flavorful with those Kalamata olives. Just cover it up, pop it in your fridge or your tote bag and you're ready to go. That is one of my favorite snacks. I hope you like it too. We are gonna uh, take your questions. I know you have lots of them to continue um, trying to get answers to eating healthy uh, as you're a student. So stay put. We'll be right back and uh, bring them on. All right, Sue, thank you so much for those wonderful cooking demonstrations. I think that was a lot of fun for everyone to see. Um, I'd now like to open the program up for questions. And Sue is here with us live right now. And we'll 
come on and show you herself. Um, we'll do as our best to get through all of the questions uh, that are possible in the time remaining. Um, if you'll see a chat box on your screen on the right, there's a control panel with a question box, and you can write your question into that space. I'll be reading the questions, and uh, Sue will come on and respond to them as they come in. There's Sue now. Um, Hello, everybody. Hi, welcome. So Thank I. You. Uh, Oops, I have a question to get us started. Um, first of all, here's a question that concerns uh, protein. Someone asks, I'm vegan, I can't eat eggs. What would you suggest that I use instead of the egg on the avocado toast? Yep. Um, one really great uh, meat substitute for people who are vegan is tofu, and I'm sure if you're vegan, you're pretty familiar with tofu, I would uh, simply scramble some uh, firm tofu, and um, if you're not familiar with tofu but want to give it a try, it's, it's uh, super easy. Buy um, firm tofu at the grocery store. It's probably going to be in the refrigerated section of uh, the produce aisle, um, and all you need to do is take it out of the package, drain it on paper towels, it's packed in this uh, water, so it is pretty moist, and you don't want a lot of that water in your scramble. So you're going to want to drain it on some paper towels, and, and I'd say about 10 minutes. You're going to want it to, to sit on the paper towels, but just really squeeze that dry. Um, depending on how many uh, servings you're making of the toast, um, maybe a, a quarter of a, a block of tofu. They're, they usually are about 12 or 16 ounces. Um, for one person, that would probably be plenty. And um, what I would do then is to just saute some garlic and maybe a little um, curry powder would be awesome. And that would color the tofu a little bit yellow so it would resemble an egg. Um, and maybe a sliced green onion. Just saute those things in a little olive oil um, just to get them warmed up a couple of minutes. And then add this block, this one quarter of the block of tofu, crumble it into the pan, and kind of stir it with all of the um, the stuff that you've been sauteing, and then just put that on your toast, and you're good to go. So it's really it's terrific, and it's almost as like eating a scrambled egg. I mean, it's hard to tell the difference. It's really great. So that's what I would do. That's a great answer, Sue. Thank you. Uh, our next questioner says. Uh, I don't like sweet bell peppers. Are there any other things that you would recommend as the transportation for the stuffed dish? Yeah, um, I would. What I would do is take an English cucumber. Now, those are the long, skinny cucumbers that are sometimes wrapped in plastic. I love those because they have a really thin skin, and you can eat the skin. It's not tough, and, um, and the seeds are small and um, not, they don't get in the way uh, of, of the flavor and the, and the texture and sometimes seedy cucumbers can be um, not my favorite thing. I keep talking about me here and it's not about me, but that's just what I would do. English cucumber and cut um, chunks, you know, like about mm, maybe that big, that wide, and then stand them up on the flat side and then scoop out a little bit of that middle part and then squeeze the hummus into the cucumber round. And then that, if you, if, um, if bell peppers aren't your thing, then uh, the cucumber might be a great substitute for that. You make a little cucumber cup um, and take those along with you. They'd be terrific. Great, thank you. Um, we mm -hmm. have a question about olive oil. How do you know what the right kind is to choose when you're at the store? Wow, that is a great question. And it's not an easy task, but if, if you're just at the store and you have that wall of, of olive oil and you're just staring it down, um, a few things to look for, I would say, would be the words extra virgin on the label. Um, that's going to be olive oil from the first pressing of the olive. So um, olives can undergo several pressings to get as much extraction out of them as possible. And the more extractions um, you have, the lesser quality of oil you end up with. So the extra virgin oil is going to be your best quality of oil. So make sure it's that. Um, I would also be really cognizant of the quality of the bottle that it's in. You want something that's going to be a dark color, dark green, 
um, dark brown. You don't want to see the olive oil. Reason being is that um, light deteriorates olive oil, breaks it down, um, and can uh, change the flavor and um, of the of that oil. So the the greener, the darker the bottle, the less light can penetrate the bottle and change the properties of the oil inside. So make sure that it's going to be a dark dark color, or it could be a tin too. That's totally fine. Um, but you know, unless you need a chance to taste a lot of olive oil. So if you have an opportunity to taste olive oils at a at a grocery store or something, by all means do it because you'll be amazed at how different olive oils taste. The green ones that have a green color are really peppery and have a lot of bite. Those are really great on salads um, for dressing things as a finishing oil. But for just normal cooking, a bottle of olive oil from the grocery store that runs anywhere from five to seven dollars will do you just fine. And it would be even as good as a salad dressing component as well. So, um, but if you're really, if you start getting into olive oils, it's like wine tasting or chocolate tasting. I mean, they, the, they run the gamut of flavor. So, um, I highly encourage you if you have, um, some time to do that down the road, uh, to do a little tasting of olive oil and see what you like. Um, golden olive oil is, um, a little more mellow. But equally as delicious, and the olive oil color is derived from the type of olive that's pressed, um, how ripe that olive might have been as it came off the tree. Um, so there's a lot of things that go into a bottle of olive oil. But I would say extra virgin is a, a key. A dark bottle is a key. And then when you get it home, be sure to store it away from your stove. You don't want it in a bottle on the stove, as pretty as that might be, because heat also deteriorates olive oil. I keep mine in a cupboard uh, and uh, it will deteriorate over time. So, um, you know, if you have a bottle of olive oil in your cupboard for a year, I would give it a taste before you use it because it's going to, a rancid olive oil will never ever leave your brain. That flavor is <laughs> burned into your brain forever and it's not, not awesome. So um, definitely keep in mind the dates. And it, sometimes the date is stamped on the bottle too, so have a look at that. But those are those are my criteria for just buying a very simple bottle of olive oil for normal everyday use. Terrific, thank you. Um, we mm -hmm. have another question, which is asking about the Waldorf salad. Is that something yeah. that can be made like the night before or the day before, and then packed for lunch? Yep, absolutely. I would say um, it will have a uh, it will be okay to eat for a couple of days. So um, you've got some time to get through that large batch of salad. You can also cut that recipe in half really easily. So absolutely can be made ahead. Great. And then um, a question about like fad, not fad diets, but things like detox diets and cleanse diets that are really popular right now. Do you have any yeah. feedback on those or any suggestions? Are they good? Are they healthy? Or do they do what they say? You know. I am very skeptical of fad diets, and I think that there's always a diet of the day. You know, it seems like there's something new every time you turn around. Um, I, I think that uh, your best, you'll get your best results if you just eat foods that aren't processed very much, lots of fruits and vegetables, whole grains, uh, lean meat, uh, eggs, a fair amount of protein because that's really going to be the thing that um, keeps you satisfied. But um, I am a firm believer in everything in moderation, and um, the fad diet thing. Just uh, I personally always feel like I'm being deprived. At a certain point, I just need some potato chips, you know. And I, and I I allow myself to do a few potato chips every so often, and that's pretty much covers my potato chip craving for a while. So I think um, I am, I personally am not a big fan of any kind of fad diet. There are certainly elements of certain diets that I, um, I'm okay with for sure. And, uh, but I, I avoid the diet du jour. That's just me. Okay. Thank you. Um, we have time for just a few more questions. I have one about 
uh, you had talked about protein just a minute ago, and this one says, so I have trouble getting enough protein in my diet. What can I do yeah. to increase that protein? Wow, that I have the same problem. So um, I struggle a lot with that. And what I have been doing is um, substituting uh, whole milk Greek yogurt on my cereal. Um, I, I eat uh, grape nut kinds of cereal, grain, grainy cereals in the morning. And while it's a little challenging to eat, uh, those cereals with just yogurt on them. I think that really helps increase the protein content. Um, Hard-boiled eggs are a great thing to have uh, in your refrigerator because you can just grab one of those and and with a little salt and pepper, it's a terrific, um, really handheld snack or or meal substitute. So um, an egg is a terrific source of protein. But don't forget that that some fruits and vegetables, or mostly vegetables, have a fair amount of protein in them. You can get some really good protein from some leafy greens. Um, grains are an awesome way to get some protein, too. Quinoa is uh, top of mind, but I farro and kamut are other options for um, grains and some protein elevation that way. And then if you combine those grains with a little bit of, of lean meat, tuna, chicken, whatever, um, they're going to actually increase your protein intake too. So um, it's thinking outside the box a little bit and, and kind of investigating what, um, what other food groups might contain some protein elements as well and kind of combining them with uh, the, le the obvious ones like meat, lean meat and eggs. Terrific. Uh, we have another question which asks, I don't always have time for breakfast. I don't have time to saute spinach in the morning. What's a smoothie yeah. suggestion or a grab-and-go item that gives me the same nutrition? Oh, wow. Well, the hard-boiled egg is a, a good option, I think, for that. And I totally get where you're coming from because, um, yeah, getting an egg and spinach and all that can be um, a, a, long, a long stretch in the mornings when you're on the go. So um, yogurt is uh, a good way, a good thing to grab and go. Um, and let's see, what else? Um, grab a smoothie. Smoothie uh, options, uh, always fantastic. That's another great way to get yogurt in and get a little protein that way. Boost it with some protein powder. Um, and then just go through the fridge. And if you have a high power blender, that really makes life a lot easier because you can throw some zucchini in there and some kale and, and um, a little honey and a, I always like to cut the sweetness with a little lemon juice or lime juice that helps um, balance the flavor of the smoothie. Frozen berries, uh, frozen banana, also great. Avocado, if you have that avocado and it's a little bit brown, toss it in a smoothie and um, you know you can kind of do do a kitchen sink kind of smoothie and I think it would be pretty pretty tasty so um, you can also throw oatmeal I have done that stitch for too and that will really fill you up um, adds a little texture another thing which sounds really crazy weird but um, red lentils cooked red lentils if you have uh, you can buy those at the store sometimes and have them in the fridge and they're all ready to go cooked but they cook in about 15 minutes they get really soft and mushy, but that is going to be a terrific source of some protein and fiber for a smoothie. It sounds weird, but try it. I think it, it might, might be something you might like. So, um, Also, spoonfuls of peanut butter, almond butter also add some really great uh, flavor and a little bit of protein to your smoothie. That's great. That's a lot of suggestions. Thank you. We're going to wrap up the questions now. If you have a question that you would like Sue to answer, you can send her an email in the next week or so, and she will respond in the next seven days. Um, so thank you again for all of your questions and responses. I just uh, wanted to point out to everyone once again that uh, our sponsor tonight is Great West Financial. They've brought us uh, Sue and this webinar, and they've also created bringhealthyon.com 
for dental students to find the recipes that you heard about tonight and also other wellness related information. So thank you very much to Great West Financial for their participation and their support of ASDA. Our next wellness webinar will take place on Wednesday, September 20th, one week from tonight. The topic is maintaining relationship wellness while in dental school. I encourage you to register on your own or with your chapter. I'd like to thank everyone for their attention and their participation tonight. Soon you'll receive an email with a link to a short survey. Please take just three or four minutes and tell us what you thought about tonight's program and any other topics you'd like ASDA to present about in the future. This program was recorded and it will be posted on ASDA's website and YouTube channel by the end of next week. Thank you everyone and good night.